Tonight was the New Year's Smash episode of Dynamite, the final AEW Dynamite of 2023, and the final Dynamite before World's End on Sunday at the Nassau Coliseum. And we had some developments tonight in the final segment of the show. It was supposed to be MJF and Samoa Joe teaming up to defend the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles against the Devil's Henchmen, two of the Devil's Masked Men. And you knew that it was going to be more of an angle than a match for two reasons. Number one, MJF is dealing with an injury, and so it would be very stupid to put him in an actual match three days before the pay-per-view. That would be dumb. But also, they sent them out there at 10 p.m. And you knew the, the overrun wasn't going to be more than maybe five or six minutes. And so the question was, were we going to get a title change or not? MJF came out to the ring, but there was no Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe was laid out in the back. He was writhing in pain. He was holding his knee. Right? This all sounds very familiar. We've seen the devil initiate attacks like this in the past. MJF said, I don't care. I'm going to defend the titles anyway. And what ends up happening is they pinned the AEW world champion on television three days before he defends his world title in the main event on Saturday. Now, there's a good aspect to that, and there's a very bad aspect to that. The very bad aspect to that is that you just pinned your world champion by two nameless, faceless individuals on television three days before your pay-per-view to tell the same story that you just told a month ago at Full Gear, where the champion is hurt, he's wounded, Going into his main event match against Switchblade Jay White, here we are now the following month, it's the same story again, where the champion is wounded going into his main event on pay-per-view. The good aspect to what they did is they finally got those Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles, the fuck off of MJF. Sayonara. Finally. He's rid himself of the Ring of Honor Tag Team titles. That I like, but the way they went about doing it, questionable. However, as it turned out, Samoa Joe was not hurt, and we got the big reveal, which you could see coming, you know, as the devil flashed on screen when it was all over, and the words, pleasure doing business with you, appeared on screen, and you could see it coming, and Samoa Joe smashes MJF right across the back with a steel chair. Lays him out, and the final parting shot of the show tonight is Samoa Joe standing over his dead body with his foot planted firmly on MJF's chest, holding up the AEW World Heavyweight title. Samoa Joe, unlikely to become the AEW World Champion at World's End on Saturday. All I will say is this. I was not convinced. Everybody was trying to convince me, oh, it's Adam Cole. Adam Cole is the devil. It's Adam Cole. And I, I was unconvinced because I said, first of all, Adam Cole is, I, I do believe that Adam Cole is hurt. And I also just looked at it and said, well, you know, they're dragging this out for so long. I wonder if they're going to go in a different direction. They're going to give us a little bit of a twist. I just can't see it being Adam Cole if he is that injured. The only logical explanation that one would be left with based on the way they went off the air with this show tonight is that Adam Cole is the devil. I guess with an outside shot that it could potentially be Britt Baker. A lot of people have thought maybe it's Britt Baker. That's really the only logical conclusion one could be left with, because if you remember 
When this all started and MJF finally agreed to give Joe his shot, let Joe be his partner and defend the titles, go ahead and give Joe that shot, it was Adam Cole. Adam Cole is the one who talked him into it in the first place. Samoa Joe wasn't just working with the devil for one week. He's been working with him this entire time, or her, this entire time. So I will sit here and tell you now that, yes, actually the person, the name, or names that make the most sense for the devil reveal would be Adam Cole and or Britt Baker. Because then you could tie it all together. All I know is this. We need to get the devil reveal on Saturday at World's End. We've heard Wardlow talking about how your world is coming to an end, right? Really teasing that he's tied in and involved in this in some way. If he's not the devil, that he could be, you know, one of the devil's henchmen. And I'm looking at the, the big picture here. Okay, how could this all play out? If it all plays out on Saturday, are we looking at Adam Cole and or Britt Baker as the devil? And we're looking at Matt Taven and Mike Bennett as your new Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions, because I'll bet you anything they were the ones supposedly under the mask, right? Under the black masks tonight, they're probably the new Ring of Honor World Tag Team Champions. You get Adam Cole leading Roddy and the kingdom and Wardlow could be tied in there as well because he doesn't like MJF. That may be your crew. It could be Cole and Britt with the kingdom and Wardlow. That could be the devil's crew. That's what's looking likely to me here as we head into this weekend. But that was how they went off the air. The best part of the show tonight was nothing that happened in the closing segment. The best part of tonight's show was the Continental Classic. And this really has been the case for Dynamite and Collision, for that matter, for the entire month. The Continental Classic has given us some great professional wrestling on television. Brian Danielson has had just match after match after match, just going out there and delivering every single time. We saw Mark Briscoe going out there week after week, even though he couldn't win a fucking match to save his life until the very end, having great match after great match. So many different people. You could say that about in this tournament. But the one person that we should have been looking at from day one is the one that I think a lot of people, myself included, really were not looking at. And it was the guy who was the one to initially go out there and say, I'm putting my belts on the line. This tournament, I'm putting my Ring of Honor World Championship and my New Japan Strong Openweight title on the line. It was Eddie Kingston, right? He was the one who made that announcement at full gear last month. This entire tournament has been the Eddie Kingston story. From day one. It was never about Swerve Strickland. It was never about Jay White. It was never about anybody except Eddie Kingston. That came into full focus on the show tonight because we are now heading into a final this weekend of John Moxley one on one with Eddie Kingston. And I know a lot of people are going to be very upset that Swerve didn't win or Jay White for that matter. I was kind of pulling for a Jay White win, to be honest with you. Did I have any great interest in seeing John Moxley go all the way to the finals? Fuck no. What does John Moxley need to be in the finals for? Until you see the story that they're telling play out tonight in that promo segment, and then it makes sense. I loved what they did with the Continental Classic tonight. Both matches and the promo we got with Moxley and Kingston, which I will talk about, was excellent. Everything else on the show, didn't care for it. So you take away the Continental Classic stuff, and this was not a good show, because there really wasn't anything else on the show that I would say was very gripping going into this pay-per-view. You take that stuff away. This tournament has carried AEW television now for over a month. And I can only hope that as this tournament comes to a close this weekend, and we get that big reset at the beginning of January, as we kick off a brand new year for AEW, that Tony Khan has got some really good stories and really good plans in place. Because he's not going to be able to lean back and rely on this tournament anymore starting in January. We're going to turn the page. The calendar flips to a new month and a new year. And I hope that he's got some really solid stories to take us into that revolution pay-per-view at the beginning of March. And speaking of revolution, one other thing here. It became, I think, a little bit clearer what direction they may be going in with Sting for his final match. We may have gotten a very big clue as to what Sting will be doing and who he will be wrestling at Revolution on March 3rd. This is your AEW Dynamite review. It is Wednesday, December 27th. 
2023. I am the Sala Monster. Thank you so much for joining me for the final Dynamite stream of 2023. It's been fun having you guys along for the ride. Even when you don't like Dynamite, right? You always like the streams. So let's have another good one tonight. Like and subscribe. 400 likes is the goal to do Be the Booker later on in the stream. I know we're uh, already nearly halfway there, so hit that thumbs up. Super chats are open. I'm going to be reading your messages, and thank you to everybody who's already donated here before I even went live. I love you guys for that, so thank you. And uh, we'll talk about some uh, house cleaning stuff a little bit later on. Let's get right into this show, though. Because we open with the Gold League Final in the Continental Classic. John Moxley, Swerve Strickland, and Switchblade Jay White. All competing for a spot in the finals at World's End on Saturday for the Triple Crown. No time limit for the two final matches that we had on the show tonight. It's always been 20-minute time limits for every other match in the tournament. Not for either one of the finals here tonight on the show. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, they have started using this elevated hard camera angle. And I first noticed it on Collision this past Saturday, uh, where it has sort of a downward view of the ring, like an elevated downward view instead of more, kind of more of a level view. Uh, they didn't use it for the entire show. In fact, they used it for very little of the show tonight, uh, but they did open with it. They came back to it a little bit later on. So it feels to me like they're just experimenting with something new. Uh, I'm not really a fan of it, but I will say, you know, for a company that gets a lot of criticism of late for not doing enough to differentiate itself from WWE and not doing enough to make it an alternative to WWE and every other promotion that we see on TV. I appreciate the fact that production-wise, they're trying something different. Even if it's something that I don't like, at least they're trying something different. So that aspect of it I do like. And I, I want them to do that. I want them to try and experiment with new things and new ways of shooting the show. You never know what might stick. So that aspect of it I like. The Jay White tried to exit the ring once the bell rang. Swerve, though, beat him to it, and he blocked his path. Moxley sent Jay out to the uh, ringside area. Swerve kept back into the ring. He rolled up Moxley for a quick two count. Moxley and Swerve, they ended up fighting at ringside, and they teamed up to toss Jay over the barricade and into the crowd. All three men ended up brawling into the crowd here at the beginning of this match. And I think it was Excalibur on commentary who made a comment saying, this is not what I expected from this match. And I just thought, really, have you not seen a John Moxley match? You've called most of his matches in this company. How do you not see a John Moxley match devolving into a brawl in the crowd? What have you been watching? That's exactly what I expect from a John Moxley match. Especially a match like this where there's no disqualifications in a triple threat match. So Moxley crotched Jay on a guardrail. Swerve ended up sitting Moxley down in a chair. He uh, was biting at his forehead. He backed up a little bit, and he got him with the double knees. Taz said that referee Paul Turner was being very lenient, and he understood the stakes in this match. And again, I said, how is he being lenient if there's no disqualifications in this match? Boy, that's mighty nice of him to be lenient can't disqualify them anyway. It's a triple threat match. He's got no choice. <laughs> All he can do is tell them to get back in the ring. If John Moxley looks at him in the face and says, go fuck yourself, there's nothing he can do except smile and say, thank you, sir. He may have done that. All three men got back to ringside and uh, Jay chop blocked the back of Moxley's leg. Swerve, who was on the apron, Drilled Jay, who was on the floor with a knee strike. All three men got back into the ring. Moxley flipped off Swerve, who bit his finger in response. Swerve sent both men to ringside. Then he went up top, and he flew Tanahashi style with a high fly flow. Took both men down on the floor into a picture-in-picture uh, -picture break. Little tribute to uh, the new president of New Japan, Hiroshi Tanahashi. Moxley. He flew in with a tope on Swerve when uh, we came back from the break. Back inside, Moxley hit a stalling pile driver for two. And the anvil elbows followed with a transition into a key lock, which Swerve was able to escape. He went up top, and uh, when he came off, though, he dove into a kick and a paradigm shift for a two count. 
So now Moxley was very frustrated. He took Swerve outside. He went over by the table, over by the timekeeper's area. He pulled the tablecloth off. And whatever it was he was about to do, he was about to give him a power bomb, maybe, whatever it was. Jay White comes over and hits him in the back with a steel chair. And then he smashed Moxley's leg. He was on the ground. He smashed his left leg with a chair. So the John Moxley threat was temporarily neutralized. In the ring, it was down to White and Swerve. Top rope 450 splashed by Swerve a few moments later, connected, but Moxley flew in to break up the count with a stomp to Swerve. All three men were down. That took us into yet another picture-in-picture. Picture. After the break, Moxley got Jay White trapped in a sleeper hold. Swerve, though, came flying in and broke it up with a house call kick. Swerve avoided a Blade Runner. Jay White avoided a JML driver. And he sent Swerve hurling towards Moxley, who took his head off with a King Kong lariat. But then Moxley immediately got dropped with a Blade Runner. And Jay White tried for the pin. Swerve, though, interrupted to break up the count. So the match continues. So Jay White, now he's frustrated. He goes outside the ring, and he grabs the chair, brings it inside. He flattens Moxley with it. Then he wedges it in between the buckles, between the top rope and the middle rope. He went to go send Swerve into it. Swerve, though, reversed him head first into the chair hard. And Swerve then got a super... Close pinfall attempt on Moxley, and they went at it toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Swerve tried for the JML driver. Moxley fought out of it. Strickland got him down. He went up top. He was setting up for the Swerve stomp. Here comes Jay White. He gives him a shove, and he sends Swerve crashing down to the floor. Moxley, in response, nearly beheads Jay White with a lariat and then hits the Death Rider. He goes for the pin. Swerve cannot make it back into the ring in time to break up the fall. And John Moxley wins the Gold League and moves on to the finals of the Continental Classic. This was a hell of a match. Let's just talk about that first. The match itself was great. Back and forth. We had some dramatic near falls in here. Uh, I loved the match. And I will say that at least they did not pin Swerve. I didn't think that they would, because that would have been insanely stupid. But they did not pin Swerve. Now, I was not upset about him losing because it became very clear after Collision on Saturday that Swerve was not winning this match. After Keith Lee beat Brian Cage on Saturday, he was in the ring, he cut a promo, he had a cinder block in the ring. He never mentioned Swerve's name, but he was clearly talking about Swerve about what Swerve did to him a year ago when he came off the top rope with a Swerve stomp, stomped a cinder block across his chest. I think back then Swerve still had, what was it, Trench? And what was the other guy's name? Remember when he had his two, uh, his two, I don't even know what you call them, his, his heavies, his, <laughs> his minions, whatever you want to call them. Remember one of the guys was Parker Boudreaux from NXT. He got fired and AEW picked him up. Or so we thought. He was going to be one of Swerve's guys in his faction. Yeah, that didn't last very long. That was a year ago. They're coming back to this now. But Keith Lee made it very clear he was not done with Swerve, and he was going to be coming to Dynamite to confront him. I thought he was going to cost him the match. But whatever they were going to do, I said, okay, well, obviously, we're going to get Swerve and Keith Lee at World's End because this guy's not winning in the match on Wednesday. The only question is, is it Moxley or Jay White that goes to the finals? And I was thinking and pulling for Jay White because then we either get a first-time-ever match with Jay White and Brian Danielson or we get a rematch between Jay White and Eddie Kingston from the match they had in New Japan earlier this year when Jay White lost and the stipulation was that if he loses, he can never again wrestle for New Japan. Of course, the way around that would be if we got a rematch in the finals at World's End, and Jay White wins the Triple Crown. The Triple Crown is meant to be defended in AEW, Ring of Honor, New Japan, right? That could be Jay White's way back into New Japan and wrestle some matches in New Japan. So I would have been fine with the Jay White Eddie Kingston final or a Jay White Brian Danielson final on Saturday. But then I look at what they did later in the show. 
Because at this point, I'm like, Moxley. Like, why? Why is that necessary to have John Moxley in the finals of this tournament? Then I see what they did later in the show, and I have a different viewpoint on it. And we'll get into that when I talk about the Eddie Kingston, Brian Danielson. But the match itself here to open the show, this was a fucking great match. Now, when they came back from the break, Tony Schiavone was in the back with Prince Nana and a very pissed off Swerve Strickland. Strickland said he wanted this so bad as the Continental Classic was breathing life back into the wrestling business. Then he brings up Keith Lee wanting to pay him a visit tonight. And he said, look, I'm not busy on Saturday. I'm going to be on Long Island, and I'm not busy. I got nothing to do. Shivani said that, uh, actually, Keith Lee is here tonight, but he said that in case he misses Swerve, and then he pulls out a contract. He says he has this contract for a match at World's End. And Prince Nana was furious because this did not get his approval. They did not run this by him first. And Swerve calmed him down and said, let's see if he shows up on Saturday. And they walk up. And they put a graphic after this. They put a graphic up on screen showing Swerve against Keith Lee. So apparently, even though he didn't sign the contract, the match was already made official. Apparently, there was no need for a contract in the first place because Tony Khan in the back said, you know what? Put the graphic up. We're doing this match. Here's the thing I don't understand. Keith Lee said, I'm coming to Dynamite on Wednesday. I'm going to be taking your house down brick by brick, right? Which I took that to mean... If he doesn't attack Swerve, he might attack Prince Nana next, right? He took out Brian Cage on Saturday. So maybe he's going to threaten to take out Prince Nana, and that's going to be a distraction. Like, I, there were any number of ways they could have gone with this. We never saw Keith Lee on the show tonight. And yet, Tony Schiavone in this promo said, well, actually, Keith Lee is here tonight. But in case he misses you, I happen to have this contract on me. Well, if Keith Lee was there tonight, then where the fuck was he? It just makes it look like he's afraid of this guy. If Keith Lee was there, why did he need Tony Schiavone to give him the contract? Why couldn't he show up? Why couldn't he go face-to-face -face with Swerve? Hand him the contract. Now, if something happened and Keith Lee couldn't be there, he got sick. I don't know what the deal is. I don't know why they said he was there if they knew he, he really wasn't there. Or worse, he was, and they just didn't use him. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. So I'm not sure why they even had Tony Schiavone reinforce the idea that he was there. Uh, that was very lame. I'll tell you something that's even more lame, though. You know what else is lame? The fact that they did that angle I mentioned a year ago on television. And you expected Keith Lee to miss a few weeks, right? It was an injury angle. We never got the match. Keith Lee eventually came back. No match. No match. They had him doing other things. They had him doing tag team matches with Dustin Rhodes. Now, lately, they seem to be giving him a little bit of a push as a singles. I know he wrestled Shane Taylor on the Ring of Honor pay-per-view recently. Good for him. It'd be nice to see Keith Lee get a singles push, but here's what I want to know. Why did it take a year to get back to this? Why do they expect that people are still going to care about this in the way that maybe they did a year ago, 12 months later? That's why it makes me think there was some kind of a health issue involved here. But it's not like Keith Lee just vanished from television and wasn't being active. He was active. It's just, they just moved on. Now they're revisiting a dead angle. Swerve feels like a man on the ascent. This feels like it's beneath him. This feels like he's actually going backwards. But we're going to get the match finally. I guess better late than never, we're going to get Swerve and Keith Lee at world's end it only took a year to get it to get the match done i don't understand it but here we are we're getting swerving keith lee this weekend renee was on stage and she welcomed mariah may and wanted to know why she attacked riho last week and mariah may said that she did so to support tony storm which is something that all of us should be doing Mariah said that she did so, well, she said in 2023, it wasn't very glamorous for her. That's also part of the reason why uh, she's, she's so supportive of Tony Storm, but yet for her, 2023, it wasn't a lot of glamour in this year. But 
2024 is going to be a better year for her. And that's why she's here to announce that she's going to make her in-ring debut next week. On the very first Dynamite of 2024, there were people in the crowd who booed, which was the only noise I heard for this entire segment. But they booed. Riho's music hit. And then the chase was on. Mariah ran into the ring. Riho chased after her. Mariah was begging off. And then here comes timeless Tony Storm. And I love how when they show Tony Storm running down to the ring, they immediately switch to black and white. And Tony got into the ring and she tried to hit Riho with her AEW women's title. Riho ducked it. And then Tony ended up in the ropes in position for the 619. Luther is standing there. Instead of doing something to actually rescue this woman, he's just standing right in front of her going, no, no, no. Riho comes off the ropes. Tony gets out of the ring just in time. Luther then pulls her to safety. Riho goes up to the top, drops them both with a cross body block to the floor. And then the segment ended with Riho posing with the women's championship in the ring. That is going to be your women's world title match on Saturday. It's fine. It's someone for Tony Storm to beat. The story is not Tony Storm and Riho. The story is Tony Storm and I was gonna say May Young. <laughs> That's definitely not the story. The story is Tony Storm and Mariah May. That is the longer term story that they're telling here. Although I am still holding out hope that we will get another Tony Storm Jamie Hader. I'm still waiting for Jamie Hader to come back. I can't believe she's been gone for half. I remember when she first got hurt, they made it sound like, oh, she's got a little shoulder trouble, nothing too serious. Seven months later, this woman is still gone. How bad was that injury? Hopefully we get her back very soon. Hopefully we get her back in time for Revolution. But uh, those of you who don't like Riho, you're not going to have to worry. Because Riho will be defeated on Saturday, and Tony will move on to the next. So, calm yourself down. Well, the Riho regime is going to come after you. We got a video package for Miro, who said that once the Continental Classic was finished, he would look to fight Andrade El Idolo. He doesn't want to fight Andrade because he's a client of his wife's, which doesn't sound right. His wife has been, uh, has been managing Andrade. That's, that's what he means. That's what he means by client. That could be taken so many different ways. But that's not why he wants to wrestle Andrade. He doesn't want to wrestle him because he's a client of his wife's. He wants to fight him because Andrade is an asshole. And so that match is now official for World's End. We didn't have too many matches official for this pay-per-view coming into this week. This is, this is what AEW does most of the time. They wait until the week of and then they finalize half the card. That's what they did tonight. We got the rest of the card filled out tonight here three days before the pay-per-view. Uh, by the way, I should mention this. Uh, C.J. Perry, Miro's wife, uh, for those of you who don't know, she was in the hospital last week with a, a pretty serious, pretty nasty infection in her finger. Uh, she says she got it, I got it, got it from a splinter, I guess, at work. She was at a taping, I don't know how she got the splinter, and somehow it developed into a very serious infection in her finger, and she posted the photo, which I didn't need to see, but she posted it, and it was all... It was all nasty, and the problem is the infection started traveling up her arm. That's not good. It sounds like a staph infection. So she was in the hospital. She underwent surgery. I know they sent her home the other day, so she must be on the mend. So hopefully she's doing better. That, that could turn into something very bad very quickly. So thankfully she seems to be doing okay. Tony Schiavone was in the ring for this next segment. And Tony said that he was told they would be doing a celebration for Boxing Week. Now, for those who don't know, Boxing Day is a national holiday in Canada. The day after Christmas, every single year. Of course, today was December 27th, not December 26th. So they turned it into Boxing Week. Is that a thing? I thought it was just Boxing Day. Were they just taking creative license with that? According to him, it was Boxing Week. And he introduced Don Callis and the Don Callis family. He comes out with Powerhouse Hobbs, Kenosuke Takeshita, and Kyle Fletcher, who just won the Ring of Honor television title at Final Battle. So they had four easels set up in the ring behind Tony and behind everybody with photos or paintings, you know, that were covered by a black 
a tarp. Callus immediately took the microphone away from Shivani and said that he had something important to say. He said there's been a lot of family stuff going on outside the wrestling business the past two weeks, and it's been a difficult time for him. At times like this, you need your family. And he could not have gotten through this without having his family with him. I thought he was going to insult Kenny Omega for being in the hospital. He never mentioned Omega. He has to celebrate Boxing Week in Canada. He got them some gifts. And he unveiled the first painting, which was of him looking ripped with Powerhouse Hobbs. His gift for Takeshita was one of him and Takeshita. Takeshita, I think, had like a samurai sword. And then uh, Callus was sitting down in front of him, and he had the uh, the Roman Reigns Samoan uh, tribal tattoos on his body. Then the next photo was him. The next painting was of him with Kyle Fletcher. He was missing the tattoos. So anyway, he says his family feels complete. Sammy Guevara's music hits. And out comes Sammy for the first time since becoming a father, and he did not look happy. Fatherhood will do that to you. Uh, it was also his first time back on TV since the concussion that he suffered at Wrestle Dream. We have not seen him since then. Callis said, uh, it's like Christmas all over again. Sammy is here. And Sammy cut him off and said, a long time no talk, Don. Callis said, you didn't get the gift I sent you? He said, well, I got a gift for you. I've been hauling it around for the last two months thinking that you were actually going to come back to work. And he told Sammy to go ahead and pull the tarp off of his painting, and he did. And it was a painting of Sammy holding his newborn baby, and all the other members of the Callus family were standing behind him. In the, uh, it reminded me of, uh, what was that movie? Three Men and a Little Lady. Remember that? Remember that movie? It's a Ted Danson, and it was uh, Steve uh, Gutenberg, and who was the other one? I forgot who the other one was. This whole family with Sammy and the new baby. So Sammy was upset, and he asked him, who the hell told you to put my baby on? Callus said, let's be honest, you're not exactly mentally capable of being a parent. You're going to need all the help you can get. And so that's what we're here for. Sammy said, we had Will Hobbs over here, who beat Chris Jericho. We have Kanosuke Takeshita, who has two wins over Kenny Omega. Yeah, who's pointed that out to you recently? Two wins over Kenny Omega, but nobody remembers that because Callus has to always make it about himself. And then he complained that he hasn't heard from Callus at all since he got concussed. Tom Selleck. There you go. How could I forget? Magnum P.I. Yeah, Tom Selleck, Steve Gutenberg, and Ted Danson. Callus talked about his disappointment that Sammy dropped the ball when he got hurt. And then he was gone on maternity leave. And yes, that's not, I mean, that's not my mistake. He said maternity leave. So he gave him the choice. Either choose your other family or you choose the Don Callis family. But before he answers, he says, I want you to think long and hard about your answer. Because if you answer this question wrong, you're going to be remembered as just a big failure, just as big of a failure as you are as a parent. Sammy didn't like that, so he knocked Callus down on his ass. And, of course, the other members of the Callus family then jumped. They pounced on Sammy and attacked him. Laid a beat down on him until Chris Jericho runs down to the ring with his baseball bat and the heels scattered. Jericho, uh, I think he got a shot in on uh, Takeshita. Did he get a shot in on Takeshita and Hobbs? I thought he hit both of them. But anyway, he then smashed three of the four paintings that were in glass. Was it real glass? I don't know. Let's ask our friend Jack. Jack, was it real glass? No, he says no. He shakes his head no. But he smashed each of them, and whatever it was, glass went flying. So poor Grandma Esther sitting in the front row might have some shards of glass in her eye now. Before he got to the fourth portrait, though, he gave the bat to Sammy. He let Sammy do the honors, and Sammy smashed the painting of him with the baby and everybody else. So Jericho and Sammy come face to face. Last time we saw them, Sammy had turned on him and gone heel. This time, it looked like they were coming in for a handshake, and Sammy instead went in, and he gave Jericho a big old hug. So just like that, Sammy Guevara back together with Chris Jericho once again a babyface.
Starks, but the reunion did not last very long because who comes out? Ricky Starks and Big Bill. They attack both men from behind and beat them both down. Now the lights go out. Tony Khan loves it when the lights go out. Lights come back on, and it's Sting and Darby Allen in the ring. And Sting has his baseball bat. He clubs Big Bill. This was hilarious. So he hits Big Bill with the baseball bat. And Bill now is standing there. He turns towards Jericho because the spot is that Jericho is going to take his bat. And now he's going to hit him with it. So he feeds himself into Jericho. He's waiting. And Jericho hits him. with. He's being hit with baseball bats, right? So what does he do? Instead of going down. No. Now he gets hit the second time with the bat. Now he walks over towards Sting and gives Sting his back. And he waits for Sting to hit him with the bat. Still doesn't go down, though. So then Sting takes the bat and hits him in the knee. And finally, Big Bill goes down. It looked like he didn't know what was going on. And then finally, he rolled out of the ring. And, you know, I'm like, way to kill the baseball bat gimmick. I don't give a fuck that the guy's seven feet tall. When you get hit with a baseball bat, especially the second and third time, you should go down. Instead of making it obvious that you're feeding for your opponent. Finally, this guy goes down. He rolls outside. As far as what they did here, Tony Khan was put in a tough spot because he had already announced a tag team title match for this pay-per-view coming up on Saturday. It was going to be Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega against Ricky Starks and Big Bill. And Kenny Omega got stricken with diverticulitis. He ends up in the hospital. Right? Nothing Tony Khan can do about that. Now, you could just take the title match off the show and not replace it with anything involving those men and just wait for Kenny to heal up and come back. Or you could take Jericho, you could put Jericho in a singles match with Ricky Starks. It's already been done before. Tony Khan had to go to a plan B. His plan B was to go with Sammy Guevara being flipped back to babyface so that he could link back up with Chris Jericho. And to be perfectly honest with you, if Kyle Fletcher now is going to be a member of the Callis family, plus Hobbs, plus Takeshita, there really was no room left for Sammy anyway. Sammy's going to feel like he's playing the, you know, the fourth man. Fifth man, even behind Callis. Callis is number one in that group, right? So Sammy would be number five, right? He doesn't need to be number five. So the best thing for him, frankly, at this point was to get him out of the group. So yes, it's ridiculous that they just turned him and now they're turning him back. But you know what? I'm going to give him a pass on that just because of the circumstances. And in that moment, what I thought is, okay, well, they flipped him because we're going to get Jericho and Sammy against Ricky Starks and Big Bill. Because what did Jericho say on television last week? All right? Do you remember what Jericho said? Jericho said, I have a signed contract for a match, and I think he said tag team title match, at World's End. So don't think you're going to be getting out of it that easily, right? I still have an open contract. I'm going to find myself a partner. So at the end of this, you're thinking, okay, well, that's the partner. They flipped Sammy back. Jericho and Sammy now challenge at World's End for the tag team titles. Except later in the show, they announced that the match on Saturday is going to be an eight-man tag, not for the tag team titles. I thought the open contract was for the tag team titles. Apparently not. So now we're getting an eight-man tag instead. It's going to be Sting, Darby, Jericho, and Sammy against Ricky Starks, Big Bill, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Kyle Fletcher. Kyle Fletcher, just him being in the match, just screams, I'm taking the pin. <laughs> Team Sting isn't losing. They've mentioned the fact that Sting has not lost a match of the 20-some-odd matches he's had since he debuted in this company. He has never lost a match. He's retiring in March. There's no drama here. Sting is not losing on Saturday. He might. Look, he could potentially lose in March. I still don't think he's going to lose that either. He could potentially lose in his last match and put somebody over. But he's not losing this weekend. So that's why Kyle Fletcher is likely in the match. It better be. It better not be a case where fucking powerhouse Hobbs is uh, going to be the one taking the pin. But, you know, again, it just it, it's just bizarre to me. I just think back to what Jericho said last week, and 
Is Tony Khan said, well, instead of a tag team title match, we'll just do an eight-man tag instead so we can get Sting and Darby on the show. I can't imagine that was the plan from the get-go, you know, that it was going to be Jericho and Omega and Sting and Darby is what it would have turned into. So I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand why they didn't just turn it into Jericho and Sammy if they went through the trouble of doing the Sammy turn. It just... Very bizarre. But there was a line in this promo where Sammy mentioned when talking about Don Callis, that everything is about him. And he specifically mentioned, you have powerhouse Hobbs who beat Chris Jericho. Squashed him, in fact. And you have Kenny Omega losing twice to Kanosuke Takeshita. And basically, you've squandered those wins and made it all about yourself. They're taking reality, and they're weaving it into the story. Look, I'm glad that they're self-aware. And they mentioned that because I've mentioned that for several weeks now. In fact, I have a whole clip up on the channel with the headline, what happened to Takeshita? I've been wondering that myself. Three months after he beat Kenny Omega, actually probably closer to four months at this point, at All Out, back-to-back, back, in fact, at All In and then All Out, Kanosuke Takeshita is actually in a worse spot now than he was three months ago. How is that even possible? You know, even if it was a case of, well, you know, we, we may have had plans with Omega, Omega and Jericho were going to win the belts at World's End, and then maybe they would have defended them against Hobbs and Takeshita. That's why Hobbs and Takeshita have been teaming lately on Rampage a few weeks ago anyway. I'm not so sure now, because the obvious plan for Saturday is not the plan that Tony Khan went with. So you know what? I'm not going to give him credit for something that never happened. Maybe that was the plan. Maybe it wasn't. All I know is that Takeshita is in a worse spot now than he was three months ago. And what Sammy said in this promo is a shoot. It is 100% fact. They have squandered whatever those victories were worth over Jericho and Omega on television, on pay-per-view, have been squandered for no reason. But at least they're self-aware enough to admit it and weave it into this promo here. But I said at the beginning of the review that Sting's opponent or potential opponents for Revolution after this show tonight have come into focus a little bit here. Because where I think this may be headed, Jericho and Sammy may end up winning the tag team titles. I think a lot of it really boils down to how long is Kenny Omega going to be out for? Because he looked, I mean, when he posted from the hospital, he looked like he was in a bad way. And diverticulitis is not something that you just bounce back from in two weeks. He could be gone for a few weeks. He could be gone for a few months, right? We just don't know how long. But if they could get Kenny back relatively soon, I wonder if the idea is to have the tag title switched over to Kenny and Jericho in the match for Revolution, right? To give Sting a match with some big names and a big star power and a big match for him to go out on. Is Sting and Darby in Greensboro challenging for the AEW tag team titles against Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega? Now, you could do Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara. Omega would be a bigger star, though, to put in that match. Or it could very well be Ricky Starks and Big Bill. But to me, you know, for that to be the, the final match of Sting's career, honestly, Jericho and Omega would pack more of a punch, just from a star power perspective. But it seems to me like Sting may be winning the tag team titles in his final match and retiring as champion. I mean, Tony Khan reveres him. And I think that he looks at Sting. I don't think he wants to beat him at all. I think he wants Sting to be the only man in AEW history to come in and to retire undefeated. And he's probably going to send Sting out with a tag team title win. And then after Revolution, they could vacate the belts and have a tournament, right? Because he loves tournaments. So they could have a tournament to crown new tag team champions. That's where I think this is going. I, I mean, I never thought Sting was going to be in a singles match. He hasn't done a singles match. Right? They protected him and had him in tag team matches. I think, frankly, that's by Sting's choice. I don't know that he trusts himself to have a long sort of, you know, pay-per-view singles match at this point. So Sting and Darby, instead of them wrestling each other, Sting and Darby as partners winning the tag belts. I'm kind of surprised, frankly, they haven't won the tag belts yet. I think that's what Tony Khan is saving for Revolution. And I'm fine with that. Whoever it's against. If it's Jericho and Omega, if it's Ricky and Big Bill, 
the Young Bucks, I mean, who, whoever it would be against, uh, sending Sting out like that, I think, is fine. I think that would be a cool way to send Sting out on his way. Now, Renee was backstage with Roderick Strong and The Kingdom. They were showing off their bulletin board of who is and is not the devil. All signs, he said, pointed to MJF as the devil, and he promised to expose Max. I have to assume that the bulletin board here was uh, inspired by It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. The uh, Pepe Silvia thing. I, I'm sure that was the whole point of doing the segment the way they did it. That's a, a famous scene from that show. Then we have the Continental Classic Blue League final with Brian Danielson going one on one with Eddie Kingston. Loud chance for Eddie Kingston. This was a very pro Eddie crowd here in Orlando. Booze for Danielson, yays for Eddie Kingston. And they showed a replay of. Danielson grabbing and holding up a sign. Many weeks ago when he beat Eddie in the Continental Classic, and he grabbed a sign, and you see it here in the artwork tonight. Shout out to Steve. He held up a sign from the crowd that said, Eddie is a bum. And they made it a point to show that sign. It was like a flashing neon sign that said, Eddie is getting his win back. Eddie is getting his win back. Because that was the story. It's the redemption arc of Eddie Kingston in this tournament. So Eddie hit an early Saito suplex, and then he wrecked Danielson on a suicide dive. Both men actually went backwards into the steel guardrail. Danielson battled back and hit Kingston with a flying knee off the apron. And then Danielson stood over him and taunted the crowd, heading into a picture-in-picture break. As if there was any doubt about who was playing the role of heel in this match, Brian Danielson left no doubt. Danielson caught Kingston in the label lock. And Kingston reached the ropes to break the hold. Brian got Eddie up on the top turnbuckle facing the crowd, and Danielson joined him on the ropes. He was going to go for a side suplex. In mid-suplex, though, in mid-stride, Kingston turned his body and landed on top of Danielson, and Danielson sold as if he had landed on the eye, because he still has the, uh, it's not really a patch, but he's got the bandage around the eye. So he sold it like Eddie landed on the eye. We got a double down here, took us into picture and picture. And during the picture-in-picture, picture, both men came face-to-face, face and, and uh, Danielson just spat right in Eddie's face. Then we got a chop battle between the two of them, and they were just brutalizing each other. And Kingston got Brian down on his knees and just kept chopping away and chopping away, and Danielson's chest was all bruised and bloody underneath the skin. But he grabbed Kingston, and he delivered a shoulder capture suplex for a near fall. So now Danielson starts laying in the yes kicks. And then Eddie Kingston, from his knees, looks up and spits in Brian Danielson's face, right? Just for what Danielson did to him, he spat right back in his face. So Kingston ends up turning Danielson inside out with a lariat. He followed that up with a Northern Lights bomb, but Danielson kicked out. And they mentioned on commentary that's how Kingston beat Andrade in the main event of Collision this past week. So Danielson connected with the Busaiku knee. He stacked Eddie for the pin, and Eddie Kingston got a shoulder up to stay alive in this match. After this, Danielson started raining down the hammer and anvil elbows. Bryce Remsburg is there to check on Eddie and make sure he's still conscious or else he's going to call it off. Eddie is telling him, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then Brian looked to the crowd and said, it's time to kick this man's head in. Bryce was, and he proceeded to do just that. Bryce Remsburg, again, is checking on him to make sure, are you, are you alive? Are you conscious? Can you continue? And just to show that, in fact, he is still in this, he lifted his middle finger up at Brian Danielson. And Danielson had a nice little smile at that. He enjoyed that. Loud chance of Eddie. Brian then backed up into the corner. And when he came in for another Busaiku knee, he ran right into a spinning back fist and then a half and half suplex. There was another wild back fist that connected. And then Kingston hit a Kawada style power bomb with a high stack to pin Brian Danielson and win the Blue League final. That sends him to the finals of the Continental Classic on Saturday to challenge his good friend, John Moxley, who made his way down after 
And before I even get into the post-match, though, let me just talk about this match. Great, great stuff. I enjoyed this even more than the opener. This was a fantastic battle. This was better than the match these two had on television a few weeks ago, and I thought that was an excellent match. They topped it. This was even better. It helped that the crowd was firmly behind Eddie because Eddie is the underdog in this tournament, which sounds kind of weird because Eddie is the one who came into this and said, I have two titles. I'll put them both on the line. He's the champion. He's the defending champion. How could he be the underdog? Well, that's the story they've been telling with him. And so the fact that the fans were so into it and they were so behind Eddie, you would hope that that was the case. Otherwise, it would kind of fuck with the whole story. Uh, but it was great. And, and again, Danielson had been like bullying this guy heading into this match. You don't have enough heart. You're, you're not the kind of person you're not going to beat me. You're not going to go to the finals of this thing. And in the end, he took that and he shoved it right back in his face and said, fuck you. Yes, I can. So I thought the match was fantastic. We get to the post-match. John Moxley comes down to the ring to check on Danielson, his fellow Blackpool Combat Club member. Then he looks up and he locks eyes with Eddie Kingston. And he grabs a microphone and he says, Eddie, all I've ever asked of you is 100%. Your best. And for a guy who's angry at the whole world, you sure do have a lot of people who love you. Yeah, listen to these people. Listen to this crowd, right? Everyone here in Orlando loves Eddie Kingston. AEW fans across the country, across the world, they love Eddie Kingston. Everyone on Saturday at World's End is going to love Eddie Kingston. He said, they deserve your maximum effort. The problem is, I know you better than you know yourself. I know that you can't beat me, and you know that you can't beat me. So you've already lost. You've already given up. You're already making excuses. But that's not going to fly this time. A couple of years ago, I gave you the shot of a lifetime, and I let you off the hook. I let you go out on your shield. I let you die a warrior's death when I didn't have to, because I wanted you to come back stronger because I believed in you. This time, you're not going to get one single favor. You want to be a Triple Crown champion just like all your heroes? You're going to have to earn every inch. And uh, I assume that he was referring to their title match at full gear uh, three years ago. So it was actually three years ago instead of a couple of years ago. Uh, but I assume that's the match he was referring to. So then Eddie grabs the microphone out of Moxley's hand. And he tells him, you've talked enough. He goes, let me tell you something, dog. <laughs> Don't come out here and treat me like your young boy bitch, Yuta. Because I'm no young boy. Remember something. I'm your senpai. I broke in before you. You're lucky I let you breathe. But you're right. I hate myself more than I hate anyone else. But on Saturday, the king of the bums is going to push you. You told me one time when I wanted to quit AEW. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to quit because we need guys like you around to shape the younger guys. I'm going to give you everything I have. You better show your fighting spirit because I'm going to show you mine. And I'm going to bust you up and enjoy it. And then he said, that's my outline, Topher. So tell him, that's my outline. Play my music. And they did, in fact, play the man's music. Wow. That was a great fucking promo. That, that right there is a promo to sell you on a pay-per-view match from two guys who were masters at it. John Moxley, there, I can't tell you how many times over the years that John Moxley, and I feel like even if you are not someone who likes John Moxley's matches, if you just don't like him, you don't like, oh, he's a deathmatch guy, he can't wear again. His promos on these go-home shows going into so many pay-per-views over the years have been excellent. He knows how to take home a promo heading into a big pay-per-view fight. This was no different. Hit all the high notes, made it very clear. Look, you and I went toe-to-toe -to -toe three years ago. I let you live. This time, I'm not going to be so nice. You can't win the big one. You can't beat me, basically, is what he was saying. I know you. And then Eddie with the comeback, letting him know. You know, every. I mean, it was just, it was perfect. It was exactly what it needed to be to help sell you on this match. So I thought that the, the match itself was excellent. Uh, I thought the promo was great. And again, here's a guy who was on the brink of elimination at the beginning of this tournament. You know, he put his belt up on the line. He couldn't win a match to save his life at the beginning of this thing. 
And I think it w- there was one point during this tournament where he was one loss away from being mathematically eliminated. And so from the brink of elimination, you know, this guy was able to fight his way back, the big valiant comeback, all the way to the finals in New York. That's not New York City. It's Long Island, but still, Moxley's an Ohio guy. Eddie's a New York guy. Plenty of people from the city are going to be coming in for that show. I don't know how many tickets they have sold. They'll probably have 10,000 or so in the building, which, you know, is is a good number. I wouldn't call that great, but it's a good number. I don't know what they have it set up for. Uh, I know the capacity is a lot more than 10,000, but there's going to be a lot of people coming in, a lot of Eddie Kingston fans at that show on Saturday. He will be the hometown favorite at World's End. And so it's the big comeback story. A guy who really... Nobody gave a chance, if you watch the beginning of this thing, makes it all the way to the finals, right? That's why I said before, he's the underdog going into the finals this weekend. And not only now is he one win away from winning the entire thing, but he's one win away from not only keeping his titles, but winning this brand new championship that they're creating out of thin air, and they're merging them all together and calling it the Triple Crown, which, as I've said, means nothing to me. That'll be on Tony Khan and AEW a year from now when we come back for the Continental Classic Part 2. That by then, this Triple Crown actually means something, right? That's up to them to make it mean something. It means nothing to me. But to Eddie Kingston, that's a different story. Because Eddie Kingston grew up a fan of all Japan pro wrestling. Not just Japanese wrestling. He was a huge mark for 90s all Japan. The two most important things to Eddie Kingston that he loves the most in his entire life, I'm sure, other than, you know, is he married or he's got a girlfriend or a wife? Other than his mother or maybe his girlfriend slash wife. The two things most important to him, DMX and 90s All Japan. And so here's this guy now going into the finals where he could become a triple crown champion. You know that to him, that does mean something. More than anybody else in this entire tournament. It means something legitimately to Eddie Kingston. That's cool. That's cool. That he would make it all the way to the finals as somebody who actually cares about that sort of thing and who would really mean something to for real. Uh, What it also does is it ties up, or potentially ties up, a longer-term story between Kingston and Moxley. These two guys, they've been friends, they've been enemies. When Kingston first came into the company that first year in 2020, right, they went toe-to-toe, and again, Moxley gave him uh, a title shot. And even just a few months ago, it was Eddie Kingston trying to convince John Moxley that he did not need to be part of the Blackpool Combat Club with that jerk, Claudio. Trying to convince him to leave the faction, right? That was only a few months ago, and then it looked like they got away from that story. So now they're coming back to it. At least that's not as egregious as waiting an entire year like with Swerve and Keith Lee to come back to it. This has been an ongoing story off and on involving these two. So you have this longer term story here that hopefully they'll be able to tie up uh, in some way on Saturday at World's End. So I like that aspect of it. In one promo, they sold me on the match where when Moxley won that opener at the beginning of the show, I was like, Moxley? What about Jay White? Again, swerve I wasn't expecting. But now they have me interested. They have my attention now, especially after that promo. I think Moxley and Kingston could be, could potentially steal the show on Saturday, especially if the crowd is as into that match as I think they will be. And we'll get to see with this Continental Classic uh, belt, the Continental title, I guess they're calling it. Uh, We'll get to see what it looks like on Saturday. They've had it covered up now for the last uh, several weeks. I'm surprised, honestly, they have it right there at the head of the aisleway. I'm surprised that there's been nobody in the crowd that's just went, fuck it, just reaches over and pulls, <laughs> just pulls the, pulls the cover off of it just to show everybody what it looks like. Not that I'm advocating that. Shout out to Issa, I see you. Acknowledge her, there you go. She'll appreciate that. After the break, Lexi Nair was in the back. She was supposed to do a sit-down interview with Christian Cage and Adam Copeland. Christian Cage was there, and we had Nick Wayne, and as he calls her, Mother Wayne, 
She was there, no Adam Copeland. He's been waiting the whole show. Where's Copeland? Copeland finally shows up. He's not in the mood to talk. He immediately attacks Christian. He ended up beating him up into the hallway, and we had the mid-card crew show up to try to break the two of them up. So we never did get the sit-down interview that we were promised. They didn't do a very good job, though, because Copeland broke free, ran down the hallway, and ended up attacking Christian a second time. And so the mid-card crew once again comes over and breaks them up. And Christian yelled out to him, called him a coward. I did spot Brian Keith in there, and I spotted the Von Erichs in there as well. We had Chris Statlander against the newly heel Sky Blue. Stokely Hathaway sat in on commentary as Excalibur talked about him trying to drive a wedge recently between Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale. Okay, if you say so. After a delayed vertical suplex by Statlander, Stokely was talking about her toughness coming back from injuries while his cousin Leon works at AutoZone, and he twisted his ankle and has been out for five years. Well, I hope Leon is uh, collecting workman's comp. Sky Blue gained control before picture in picture. By the way, I have to ask the question, since Issa is here, I wonder what she thought. Gotta tell me what you thought of Don Callis in those paintings, or at least one of the paintings, he had the Roman Reigns tribal tattoos on himself. She probably thought that was sacrilege. I'm sure that uh, she wasn't very happy about that. I thought he wore it well. I, I don't know. I don't know what you thought. But Sky Blue got control before picture in picture. Statlander fired back with a series of clotheslines and connected with a chaos theory for two. Sky Blue answered with a code blue for a near fall. So Sky Blue wanted a second rope Hurricane Rana. Statlander countered it into a powerbomb. And they fought in the corner after this, where Sky Blue slid out of a superplex attempt. And then she took the referee. So now the referee is distracted. Here comes Julia Hart, the TBS champion from underneath the ring. And Julia clobbered Statlander with her TBS title. And Sky Blue ended up winning with an avalanche code blue. I thought the match was fine. I have no idea what's going on here. Uh, nor is any of this interesting enough for me to go out of my way to watch Rampage and Ring of Honor on a weekly basis to follow this story. But this story has now bled over into Dynamite, and I have no idea what's going on. But that's fine. That's my fault. Like I said, if I was interested enough to figure out what's what's story is being told here. I would watch the other shows, but I ain't got time for that. When it was over, though, when the match was over, Sky Blue and Julia attacked Statlander before Willow Nightingale ran down to the ring and cleaned house. And as Hart and Blue retreated up the ramp, out came Abaddon, who was challenging Julia for the TBS title at World's End on Saturday. And so that was a little preview of what we are getting on Saturday. Renee was backstage with Ruby Soho and Soraya. Oh my God, this segment. This segment. Backstage with Ruby and Soraya. And Renee asks Ruby about her match coming up with Marina Shafir on Rampage this Friday. And Soraya interrupted Ruby in mid-sentence to tell her, look, I, I, she's so excited. I got a present for you because Ruby's birthday is coming up next month, which is true. I believe Ruby's birthday is coming up on January 9th. And so she got a gift. She got a present for her. But what is this present? It is Harley. Now, I know there are some people who are watching this who really don't pay attention to some of the mid-card storylines saying, who the hell was that? This Harley Cameron. She was part of QT's crew before QT said, peace out. I'm out of here. She was part of his crew. Remember they did like a, they even showed a music video that she did. That was back when they were feuding with the acclaimed. Anyway, that that's who that was. It was Harley Cameron. And she walks in, she's standing next to Soraya. And she said, she's a good little helper who will do anything. She goes, she's really good with her hands. And Ruby said, yes, yeah, so I've heard. And then she suddenly got a phone call. 
from Angelo Parker, who I you know in storyline is her new uh, her new boyfriend here. These two have been uh, hot. They've had the hots for each other now for weeks and weeks. So she goes off to talk to Angelo, and now we're left with Soraya and Harley. And Renee asks how this partnership with the two of them happened. Oh, the Judgment Day. Bobbert reviews. Hey, Bobbert, thank you. Judgment Day. So she asked Soraya, how did this uh, partnership come about with you and, and uh, Harley? And then, inexplicably, Harley Cameron pulls out a butcher knife. <laughs> I swear to God, she pulls out a butcher knife, and Soraya then uh, had to calm her down, and they walked off. What the fuck was this? Why did she pull out a butcher knife? What are, what are these stories that are playing out here on, on these other shows that I'm clearly out of the loop on here? Is, is, is her background now she's a serial killer all of a sudden? Is she going to come down to the ring with this butcher? As you know, it's not Halloween. I mean, I guess you got Abaddon walking around, so it's Halloween every week. I don't know why she had a fucking butcher knife. That sounds like something Tony Khan should probably make a ruling on. Look at this. I'm banging myself on the table here. I don't know what's going on here. I'm all spooked now. A butcher knife. All right, then. The main event was supposed to be MJF and Samoa Joe defending the Ring of Honor World Tag. She's the new butcher. <laughs> okay, I guess so, yeah. I guess the butcher is gone, and we now have a new butcher. Her name is Harley. The main event was supposed to be MJF and Samoa Joe defending the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles against the Devil's Henchmen. For the Ring of Honor Tag Team Titles. By the way, there was an update today on uh, on Liv Morgan, who was pulled over in Florida a few weeks ago with the uh, the Devil's Lettuce, and uh, some more information about the arrest. Apparently, she told the arresting officer that the vape pen in the back seat that they found her with was not hers. She says, "I have a lot of people in and out of my car. I don't know where that vape pen came from." And then they arrested. So that's the update on Liv Moore. That, that apparently was the word going around the locker room that week that the vape pen didn't belong to her. So I don't know why that just made me think of Liv Morgan for, for some reason. So that's the update on Liv Morgan. This did not start until 10 p.m. So you knew this was going to be more storyline than match. So the devil's henchmen entered through the crowd. I like, by the way, the little addition here. They had the white devil's mask. Uh, imprinted on the back of their shirts. I wonder if the devil is going to open up his own store on pro wrestling tees. Maybe he'll start selling t-shirts. He, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe he's got the entrepreneurial spirit. I guess just so we're aware that they are with the devil, we needed to see the devil's mask imprinted on the back of their shirt. So then MJF was out next, and then Samoa Joe. They played his music. The only problem is no Samoa Joe. So then they show Joe up on the big screen, and he is lying on the ground in the back, writhing in pain, clutching his knee. And MJF says, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to do this match by myself. We're doing this right now by myself. Ring the bell. So they ring the bell, and just like that, the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles are on the line. Now, he had a wrap around his left shoulder, the shoulder with the torn labrum. And he was doing a fine job by himself. Tried to pull the mask off one of the men when he got him outside the ring. But while the referee, I guess, was being distracted on the inside, another masked man rolls out from underneath the ring, and he's got a pipe. And he hits MJF in the shoulder with the pipe. And then the masked man crawls back underneath the ring. One of the legal masked men then hit MJF. They got him on the apron. He hits MJF with his own heat seeker. Spikes him. And then he covers him for the pin with his feet on the ropes and the other masked man holding the feet for leverage and he pins MJF. He pins the AEW World Heavyweight Champion to win the Ring of Honor 
World Tag Team titles. Three days before the pay-per-view. After the match, all three henchmen attack MJF when Samoa Joe's music plays again. And here comes Samoa Joe, and he's hobbling down to the ring. People are trying to hold him back. No, 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 you're hurt. He's got a chair in his hand. And he hobbles all the way down to the ring with a chair, and the henchmen bail. And Joe helps MJF. You could see where this was going. But he helps MJF to his feet. All of a sudden, the devil appears on the big screen. It's the same footage of the devil. It's like that little three-second video of the devil, and then they take it off the screen. And then a message flashes on the screen that says, Pleasure doing business with you. And they cut back to the ring, and MJF is looking up at this, and he's all confused, and Joe is standing behind him with the chair, and gee, I wonder what's going to happen next. And Joe gets this look on his face, and he takes the chair, and he rears back, and he smashes MJF in the back with the steel chair. Down goes the champion. So then he takes MJF into the corner, and he says, I did this to you. He picks him up, puts him on his shoulders. He delivers a muscle buster. And then he picks up the AEW World Heavyweight title and he plants his foot on MJF's chest and he poses with the championship to close out the show. The only positive thing about this is that they got the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles the hell off MJF because those belts weren't doing nothing for him. So that's a good thing. Everything else about this, questionable at best. Pinning MJF going into World's End? Really? Not very bright. And I know the story they're trying to tell. They're trying to tell the story where MJF, man, he just lost his Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles and broke his promise to his best friend. And he got pinned. And he's injured. The, 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 stack, <laughs> the, the stack is decked against him. No, the deck is stacked against MJF going into World's End. That's the story they wanted to tell. I get that. That doesn't make it good, but I see the story they're trying to tell. It's the same story we got a month ago at Full Gear, where MJF was hurt. We didn't even know if he was going to be able to come out and wrestle Jay White in the main event, but he did on one leg, and he still won. So now here we are into another pay-per-view, and the champion is hurt, and all I could think is, this guy beat Jay White with one leg. So, he's going to have no problem with Samoa Joe at World's End. He already beat Samoa Joe at Grand Slam when he was healthy. Now he's got the bad shoulder. Didn't stop him last month against Jay White. He'll be fine. So again, the champion is wounded going into another pay-per-view main event. So now we know that Samoa Joe, he's a devil but he is not the devil. We can rule him out. He is not the devil. That we now know. The question is, was he working with the devil this entire time, or was it just for the one week? My read on this is, he's been working with whoever this devil is this entire time. And it's why I go back to Adam Cole. And maybe it is, in fact, as simple as Adam Cole is going to be the devil, which is what most people predicted from the word go on this. Because Adam Cole is the one who talked MJF into giving Joe the shot that he wanted. Joe said, I want a rematch for the AEW world title. I'll watch your back. I'll be your partner. I'll watch your back. You got to give me my rematch. And he was not going to do it. He told Joe, piss off. And it was Adam Cole sitting in the ring in the chair in his cast with his crutches who said, no, 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 no. You've got to do this. You've got to give him his shot. So it sounds to me like this has all been the plan the entire time. Adam Cole maybe is the one pulling the strings. Maybe he is the devil after all. He and or Britt Baker end up being revealed as the devil. The thing is, I, I have no reason to doubt that the injury to Adam Cole is as they say. He is hurt. He did have significant surgery. He very likely is not going to be able to get back in the ring for a very long time. If that's the case, that means that they're going to drag this story out even longer. This is a story that needs, it's not going to end on Saturday, but this is a story that needs an end to the current chapter and to turn to the next one already. That has to happen at World's End this weekend, which means there has to be a reveal of some kind. Like, I know the story doesn't just end at World's End, but it has to open the next chapter of the story. 
as we go into this new year. Now, if that means that it's Adam Cole and then he'll just be the devil and send other people at MJF until he's ready to come back, yeah, but when is that going to be? Or have they been swerving us and the injury wasn't as serious as we were led to believe? I honestly, and I know this is going to sound silly if this is the one thing I'm basing this on, but like, I just, I know, I know how important his Twitch audience is to him and how he tries to keep the two things separate and be on the up and up with them. And I, I really don't think that he would just kind of lie to those people for the benefit of putting over a wrestling angle. Like everything about this has told me that this guy really fucked up his ankle and he's going to be gone for a while. And that's why Tony Khan had a pivot. We've had all these weird turns in this story because whatever his original plans were got shattered, literally, at Grand Slam. But if it ends up that he pulled the wool over our faces and it's Adam Cole and Adam Cole is ready to get back in the ring very soon, then hey, egg on my face. I really don't think so, though. But my God, do we need a reveal already for this story? and to move it along to whatever the next chapter is going to be. And as I look ahead now, if it is Adam Cole, I mean, Adam Cole, you have the kingdom, and you have Wardlow. And that, to me, would be, at this moment, the scenario that makes the most sense to me. The two men who won the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles tonight are nameless and faceless. They could call them that, too. Call one nameless, the other one faceless. Probably it's probably the kingdom. It's probably Taven and Bennett. I always thought the end game was going to be them getting the belts anyway. I mean, that's that's where I thought this was going. I thought Roddy was going to step in as the de facto partner for MJF. Right? Adam, I'm going to step in for him for, you, even though I don't like this guy. And then he would do something to throw one of their matches when they were wrestling the kingdom. The kingdom win the Ring of Honor World Tag Team titles. They didn't do it that way, but we may have just seen them win the belts tonight. We just haven't had the reveal yet. But if I had to take a guess right now as we go into this weekend, that would be my best guess as far as who's involved here. Now, we do have a pay-per-view on Saturday. It is the final AW pay-per-view, the final wrestling pay-per-view of 2023. It is World's End from the Nassau Coliseum. Let's do predictions. We have the full card now. We had a bunch of matches added to the card and made official tonight, so let's run through this, and I will give you my predictions as we go along. We have the Zero Hour pre-show. They have added a Tony Khan special. They have added a 20-man battle royal. The winner of that battle royal will get a shot at the TNT Championship anywhere, anytime. My hands are clasped together. Takeshita. Takeshita should win this battle royal. They intentionally kept him, by the way, out of the eight-man tag on Saturday. You would think it would be Hobbs and Takeshita tagging with Ricky Starks and Big Bill. No, no, no. It's Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher. That leaves Takeshita without a match. Put him in the Battle Royal. Let him win the entire thing. Then he'll have a TNT title match in his back pocket. Then he'll have something. Right now, he's got nothing. At least then he'll have something. Hook is going to defend his FTW championship against Wheeler Yuta. I got Hook going over here. Julia Hart defends the TBS title against Abaddon. You can't take the title off Julia Hart. She just won the damn thing. Julia's going to retain. Christian Cage defends the TNT Championship. No disqualification against Adam Copeland. I think they do the title change. I think Copeland is going to win the TNT title. That'll be his first championship, I believe, since 2011, when he retired the first time. They could always stretch this out to a, a third match. I think we're going to get a title change, though, on Saturday. And by the way, if Copeland wins the TNT title, and let's say Takeshita wins the Battle Royal, if he could cash in on that title shot anytime, anywhere, who's to say he doesn't do it on Saturday? Right? I'm just saying. Technically, it's like a money in the bank. He can cash it in anywhere, anytime. Copeland could win and then immediately lose. Miro goes one-on-one -on -one with Andrade El Idolo. And uh, I'm thinking Andrade is getting the win here. Tony Storm defends her AEW Women's World title against Riho. Tony Storm is not losing to Riho. I'm sorry, Riho regime members. Yes, you've done well. Out for combat. There you go. You're going to be going out on your second tour. Yeah, Riho is not winning the championship on Saturday. Stand down. 
Tony Storm is retaining her title. Swerve Strickland goes one on one with Keith Lee. A match that has been more than a year in the making is finally happening. It's as if Tony Khan awoke from a coma. He's been in a coma for a year. He woke up and said, oh boy, I better book this Keith Lee Swerve Strickland match. And we're finally getting it on Saturday. Now, I like Keith Lee. I don't want to make it sound like if Keith Lee wins, Swerve is buried. Swerve is done. Swerve was in the Continental Classic. He lost to John Moxley. He failed in the finals. This man should be groomed for a world championship match in the first half of 2024. I don't want to see Swerve go to World's End and lose to Keith Lee. Swerve is a man on the ascent right now. Keith Lee is not. And I would like to see Keith Lee get pushed. But this is a match that Swerve should win. Swerve needs a rebound win, and that's the win that he should get on Saturday. I'm picking Swerve to go over in this match. I think anything else would be a mistake. Doesn't mean that he's buried, but he should not be losing this match. He is the one right now with the momentum. He is the one that should be in line in these next few months for a world title match. We have Sting, Darby Allen, Chris Jericho, and Sammy Guevara. They're all going to be teaming up to take on Ricky Starks, Big Bill, Powerhouse Hobbs, and Kyle Fletcher. So, so much for the open contract that Chris Jericho said he had, presumably for a tag team title match. I guess he's going to hold off on that. He's very loyal to Kenny Omega. He doesn't want to wrestle for those titles without Kenny at his side. So we're getting an eight-man tag. Sting is not losing before Revolution. Sting is undefeated. Sting will remain undefeated. They're going to pick up the win. We've got the finals of the Continental Classic all set. It's going to be John Moxley going one-on-one -on -one with Eddie Kingston. A match that 24 hours ago, I would have said, all right, but not really excited for it. Now, they sold me on it. So as far as like a go-home show selling you on a key match for the pay-per-view, I can't say that what they did with the main event stuff sold me anymore on the main event. I mean, I like the idea of Samoa Joe challenging for the world championship in the main event. Like, I dig that. The angle they did tonight did nothing to get me any more excited for that match. But for the Continental Classic, that promo, that back and forth between Moxley and Kingston sold me. I am looking forward to that match, honestly, more than any other match on the show this weekend. And I think Eddie Kingston is going to win the Triple Crown. This, this whole tournament, it was right in front of your face, not realizing that this has been the Eddie Kingston story. And yes, they could have used this tournament to put over somebody new, somebody younger, somebody who, who could have benefited and needed it more. But that's clearly not what this tournament was designed to do. You can't say, though, that the Continental Classic was devoid of any story. You can't say that. You can't say that now. Honestly, you couldn't say that before either. The only people who would say that are the ones who haven't actually been watching the fucking tournament. They have been weaving stories into this tournament. Even Daniel Garcia, who went winless until he finally beat Brody King last weekend. Right? That's a story. The story of Eddie Kingston coming back from the brink of elimination, trying to win the Triple Crown. He grew up a wrestling fan watching people win and defend the Triple Crown. That's a story. You may not like that story, but that doesn't make it any less of one. Eddie Kingston is going to win the Continental Classic. And in the main event, MJF defends the AEW World Championship against Samoa Joe. I thought there was a chance that Joe would win this title. I did. I thought that might give Joe a token run. MJF then gets the belt back. MJF is not losing on Saturday. MJF is going to persevere, even with the injury, just like he did last month. He's going to retain the AEW world title, I believe. And my hope is that when World's End goes off the air on Saturday, the final show of 2023, we have the devil reveal that will set things up heading into 2024. Whether it's Adam Cole, Britt Baker, Jack Perry, Roderick Strong, or whoever it may be. My best guess, Adam Cole with the Kingdom and Wardlow. That's what we're going to get for the reveal. Whatever it is, I hope we get that reveal at the end of this show. And then heading into 2024, you know you've got MJF and Wardlow coming up soon. And you've got MJF and Swerve. 
which they teased last week. And we'd be very upset if they don't deliver on that match sometime, whether it be Revolution or even Double or Nothing. Double or Nothing is still a ways away. But hopefully we will get that Swerve and MJF match at some point in the first half of next year. Seems to me like that was just a tease for something longer term, and MJF is going to have some other people to run through first before he gets to Swerve. But that's your World's End preview for Saturday. And I will be live on YouTube as soon as the pay-per-view goes off the air at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can come on back here to the channel, and I will be recapping the good, the bad, and the ugly of the show. I will not be at the Nassau Coliseum. I've been to my fair share of shows at the Nassau Coliseum. I will be right here. So you'll get the live recap as soon as the show goes off the air. Here's the Twitter poll for tonight. Not a great score. 59% thumbs up. 41% of you have given this show a thumbs down. So you can go ahead and vote at Solomon's. Or Bliss Fan says, what if MJF is actually a free agent on January 1st? So Bliss Fan, apparently Bliss Fan believes that MJF could very well be done, which means he would lose the title. They could take the title off of him on Saturday. Well, I don't believe that MJF is done as of January 1st. I am in the camp who believes that MJF re-signed a long time ago. Because Tony Khan would be out of his fucking mind not to already have him re-signed and still have him in the position that he's in. So I believe he's already... I know he has said otherwise, but what else would he say publicly? That's why I didn't ask him about it. Because you're not going to... I'm not going to ask a question <laughs> that I already know the answer to. That's for other people to do. I believe that he's already re-signed. But I guess we'll find out, won't we? We're not that far off from January 1st. We won't have to wait that much longer. Hey, Del Fuego was at the arena tonight in Orlando. Del Fuego, let me know what you thought of the show. Bliss Fan says the Coliseum has become a dump. Has become? Have you been to the Coliseum before? Dump may be a little bit, a little bit strong, but I, I wouldn't exactly say it was a uh, sprawling oasis even before the renovation. I just hope that we get an actual crowd that has a pulse because the Nassau Coliseum does not always have the best reputation when it comes to lively crowds. I mean, it's, it's not quite uh, Corpses Christi, but it's pretty close. But MJF, you know, he's a Long Island guy. He's in the main event, right? Eddie Kingston. I, I think we'll get a, a good crowd on Saturday. I hope so. We'll find out. We'll all find out together. World's End. You know, all this talk about how AEW is moving to an every month pay-per-view model? Apparently not. All those people who were so sure of that. We have January coming up. There's been no pay-per-view announced. We've got February coming up. There's been no pay-per-view announced. Shows you that those people know what they're talking about, don't they? That's right, and they also teased M MJF and Hangman. So that could also be a potential direction. All right, and by the way, if you have predictions for World's End, you could also get those on in, and I will I will read them if you want to uh, chime in. Uh, by the way, people have asked me about the Iron Claw. Uh, I did see the Iron Claw yesterday, and I'm going to have an Iron Claw review going up here on the channel tomorrow. Uh, probably in the afternoon at some point, so watch for it. My full Iron Claw review on YouTube tomorrow afternoon. For those of you who have been asking me about the movie. Uh, Lady Fire Panda with the $20 Super Chat. Saw some people on X talking about wanting an Iron Claw style movie on Chris Benoit. To that, I think about what Heyman said. Three people died that night. Nancy and Daniel had no choice to die. He did. Fuck him. Well, his thoughts pretty much mirror mine. Yeah, we, we don't we don't need that. They were going to make a movie about Benoit. Remember, that was a movie that was being planned. And then it got shelved. And I think on the shelf is where it belongs. Uh, Jackie Fowler chiming in early with a $62 super chat. Hey, Jackie, thank you very much. What do you think of a match between Cody Rhodes and AJ Styles? 
former face of AEW against the former face of TNA. The story being both men carried their companies, but AJ can say he was a world champion in his. Everything Cody has done, AJ has done first. So two things about that. Number one, I think a Cody-AJ match would be great, and I would love to see it. Uh, but they are not going to base their feud in WWE on the fact that Cody was in AEW and AJ was in TNA. Never going to happen. Nor should they, because they don't have to. Because the WWE audience doesn't give a shit. They don't. They don't give a shit about their past and other companies. AJ's been... How long has AJ been in WWE now? He's been there now for like seven or eight years. Is he so far removed from TNA to bring it up now would be silly. So they will absolutely not do a feud based on that. The closest you might get is if they're going back and forth on the stick. And AJ throws a little dig in there about about that that just maybe for like the fans who know but it's not going to be based around that like there's there's no way there's no way that would happen uh steve joseph would you have a review up on the iron claw yes tomorrow it will be up tomorrow i will have an audio review up on the channel tomorrow so watch for it uh i will give you my thoughts on the movie and uh get into a lot of the Von Erich history that was not included in the movie. Including an entire Von Erich that was not included in the movie. Uh, Steve says, what was better, the wrestler or the Iron Claw? Uh, the wrestler. Wild Bird, my suggestion, AEW needs to establish a weight class division like New Japan. I don't, no, I don't think they do. I don't think that that's the answer to... The problem of uh, why people are not as excited for the AEW product. I don't think you need weight class. Weight classes has nothing to do with it. Weight classes is not going to improve the product or make it any better or any worse. It's not necessary. Also, I have a problem with AEW. They need to stop overexposing their top tier talent every week. Give them the Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns schedule. Doesn't Tony Khan already do that? Don't we have people who show up and then don't show up for weeks at a time? I thought he was already doing that. I have a solution, he says, to prevent overexposure in AEW for 2024. The most valuable top tier talent should have their own tour date posted on social media. What does that even mean? Their own tour dates? What are they singing? They're in a band? Jericho has his own tour dates. <laughs> is Malachi Black going to go on his own? I don't know what that means. You mean like independent dates? If anything, I would want my top tier talent to not be going on tour. All that does is risk injury. Tony Khan's had enough injuries this year. Uh, Zay97, thank you for the 10 bucks. I recently got back into wrestling since WWE put the belt on Jinder in 2017. That got you back into wrestling with Jinder Mahal as the WWE champion? God bless you. I only regret missing the Bloodline story. Is there any... Oh, okay, I misread... <laughs> I misread your super chat. Okay, I thought you got back into wrestling because of Jinder Mahal. I was about to say, you're so you're the one. He got out of wrestling because they put the belt on Jinder. Well, that makes more sense. I completely misunderstood your super chat. <laughs> uh, is there any moments, matches, etc. that you recommend from 2017 to 2022? I'm going to leave the majority of that to the chat. I mean, I can't possibly name everything. I mean, you missed a lot of quality, um, a lot of quality matches in that time. I can't possibly name them all. I mean, from 2017 to 2022, even when the television was at its worst as far as stories, um, 2018 was 2018 was pretty bad. But I mean, just looking at WrestleMania, there were some really class matches on some of those shows. I mean, 2019, what you missed was the whole Kofi Mania thing at the beginning of the year, where the fans really got behind Kofi Kingston. And he beat Daniel Bryan at WrestleMania and won the championship. 
Uh, I could tell you from being in the building that night, it was it was an emotional thing for a lot of the people who were there. And the Kofi Mania thing, I mean, he he held the title for six months after that, but you know, the, the, the really fun part was the story getting there. So that was the first few months of 2019. Um, the COVID era, you know, look, I, I don't think a lot of people are going to be looking back on the COVID era like, oh, I can't wait to go back and watch all those empty arena shows. Wrestling is not meant to take place in an empty arena. So I, I don't know that I would look back fondly on that period, but that's not to say that there weren't some quality matches during that period. And even with the Bloodline stuff, they would do things on TV in the Thunderdome with no fans, but you could hear them, right? Roman was talking during his matches, right? They had the freedom to, to do stuff that they couldn't do otherwise. So they tried to make the most of it. Uh, check out the Boneyard match from WrestleMania 36 with Undertaker and AJ Styles. But I'm sure the chat will uh, chime in with other things you should check out. Uh, Prince Vegeta, why does Tony Khan overprotect Moxley? Is it really that necessary to give him a win here than someone on the rise like Swerve? Well, again, he has his stories that he wants to tell, and Moxley is probably one of the highest paid guys in the entire company. Uh, he's re-signed until 2027. Moxley is one of his guys, so he feels the need to protect him. John Moxley has been the most protected guy on the roster since day one when he first came in. I mean, last year, you look at his win-loss record. It was it was ridiculous. So he, he really does. He goes out of his way to protect Moxley, which I kind of respect, honestly, that he would have one top guy he would protect that much with the hope that when he does lose, it means something. Like this Saturday when he loses to Eddie Kingston, hopefully it'll mean something. Uh, Wild Bird, maybe Private Party is helping out the devil. Uh, Food Hive, early to the party. So, what's up, chat? That was from Food Hive two hours ago. Is Food Hive still with us? What's going on, Food Hive? What are you cooking up tonight? Hypercam, hope Mariah May gets to be creative with her character not seen anyone make a generic sexy gimmick nearly as hilarious as she did in stardom i hope so too maroa with the ten dollar super chat was a great show with a bad ordering of segments devil stuff should have started followed by the three-way everything else in the same position with danielson against eddie closing and moxley and eddie promo I do wonder if part of it was also just that, well, I mean, I think the devil thing is their top storyline right now, so that's why they wanted to end with it. But also, you run the risk if you're going to close out with a promo and you're already in your overrun. If they go over, you don't want that promo getting cut off in big promo. I would actually rather that go on when it did, so that way, something else gets cut. Not that same. So I'm, I'm actually okay with the ordering on the show tonight for that reason. Uh, Devin from NJ Racing Queen is going to be my wedding song. If my bride says no to it, then that marriage will not work for me, and I will divorce her right then and there. Well, that right there is a smart man. I agree with you. Let me know how it works out. Also, want Solo Bane to be the one who marries us. That, I don't know about. You might have lost me on that. Misfit Wrestling Podcast, I still prefer Jay White finding his way back to New Japan, and I feel like this was the loophole. This would have been the loophole, but it doesn't mean that he can't find his way back at some point. I'm sure he will. It's wrestling. They'll always find a way, no matter how stupid it might sound. Paul Carpenter, so Samoa Joe was on the floor for no reason. Apparently, yeah, he was, he was throwing them off the scent. He's a good actor, right? That's why they cast him to play. What was the? What's his role? Uh, Sweet Tooth, right? In Twisted Metal. I think that guy has a future in Hollywood. Rodimus Prime swerve against Lee on Saturday. Cool. Other than that, one year too late. That said, I'm pulling for Eddie to also win. 
Dylan Hensley with the $20 Super Chat. I should have mentioned before that sometimes Ricky Starks will visit the Academy since that's where he graduated. I was at first nervous to meet him, but I always try to ask for advice, and the best advice he gave us was to work out. Well, because he knows how important that is. If you want to get television time, you got to look the part. That's smart advice. Maybe you should get on the same diet that Randy Orton and AJ Styles were on when they came back to TV. I don't know if you could afford it, though. See, they could afford it. Thank you, Dylan. That's very cool, though, that uh, Ricky graduated from the same school. I did not know that. Uh, Marquand, 1976, dropping by to say happy holidays to everybody despite being sick as a dog right now. Well, that sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. Happy holidays to you, too. I hope you... I hope you're well by the new year. I'm going to be here with all of you on New Year's Eve. I hope you're better by then. And you can join us. The Juliet. Scotty Too Hotty made AEW debut in a dark match. Just what they need. Actually, Scotty would probably be a good coach for them. Uh, in the ring, I... Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, Samoan fan, I predict that the devil will cost MJF the title at World's End and will unmask as Brandy Rhodes. The fans fucked her over, and so she screws them over back. You know, Brandy would technically be a free agent. She's not tied to a WWE contract, so she could sign with AEW if she wanted to. I think that's a terrible idea, but she could technically do that. DEH Sires, I despise babyface MJF. I am sick of it. Bobbert reviews Foosball is the devil. It says Mama Boucher. Ali Muhammad Power, Cole and Britt leading Spears, Wardlow, and. Uh, it doesn't have to be Spears. I think it would be leading Wardlow and the Kingdom and Roddy. And that's your crew. B.D. Skeleton. Dr. Britt Baker is the devil. Very possible. After tonight, I could see it. I could see it. Food Hive. I love that the company is improving its flaws. That might get you some heat. I know there are a lot of people who disagree. Based on the uh, feedback I've been Barry MK400, what was worse, the boxing match from WrestleMania 15 or the sumo match from WrestleMania 21? The sumo match from WrestleMania 21, and that's not even a question. You know why? You know how I know that? Because I'm still scarred. You know why I'm scarred. Because I still remember that moment where Big Show got thrown out of the ring, and we got a nice ass shot, and he wasn't wearing anything except the sumo gear. That doesn't, that doesn't leave your brain. That sticks with you. The boxing match, was, I mean, it was over like that. Butterbean knocked him out, and it was over. Harmless. Maybe not the bar gun, but harmless. Big Show, I'm still scarred all the... It's almost 20 years later, I'm still scarred by that. I saw more of Big Show that day than his wife does. Nash DTV. I know you hated the new Godzilla movie, but maybe I didn't say I, I didn't say I hated the movie. Who said I hated the Godzilla movie? All I said was it was a good movie. I didn't rave about it the way other people raved about it. Because to me, I, I was expecting a different kind of movie at the beginning, more of an origin type thing, and it wasn't that. And so I didn't like that aspect of it, but I never said it was a bad movie and I hated it. And by the way, he says, maybe you'll like Shin Godzilla. As soon as I came home, the next day, I watched Shin Godzilla for the first time. I actually enjoyed Shin Godzilla more. That doesn't mean I hated the new Godzilla movie. But I thought Shin Godzilla was actually really good. And was more in line with the kind of Godzilla movie I was hoping to see. The only thing I, I would say about Shin Godzilla, if you've seen it, is the first appearance of Godzilla in that movie when he makes landfall... I thought it was a joke. 
when they showed derp face godzilla i said what the fuck is that and then but i guess the story is that he was he was like morphing and he was in he was in agony or because as the movie went on he looked more like godzilla i saw that i said am i watching a comedy like you got to be kidding me is it because it has a low budget why does he look that way it looked awful not as awful as Ric Flair in this Iron Claw movie, but still pretty awful. But I actually like Shin Godzilla a lot. Derp face Godzilla, that's what he was. That's what he was. Uh, DEH Sires, this is a better version of Retribution. Is it though? Is it? Food Hive, what was for dinner? What was for dinner today? Chicken cutlets and uh, Pillsbury Crescent Rolls. Nick Grasso. After tonight, I think the devil is going to swerve Samoa Joe and cost him the title at World's End. Well, however it, however it goes down, uh, I don't think Samoa Joe is walking out with the championship. Not after tonight. DEH Sires, to be honest, this devil story has gone downhill since Punk showed up at Survivor Series. Simply because of the slight chance it was Punk, it would be the most shocking and wild. It was never going to be CM Punk. <laughs> and Daddy, Daddy Ugarte, actually, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Said Solo wanted to see teenage Godzilla bitten by a radioactive lid. <laughs> Radioactive lizard and turn into Godzilla minus, minus one. Yes. Yes. No, actually, you know what I wanted? You know what I thought this movie was? I thought that it was going to be more of an origin story coming out of the war. And, you know, the bombs have fallen and there's all the radio, you know, the, the radioactivity and everything. And we really do get something of, you know, like, what what is that? Instead of it just... Like, in the first five minutes of the movie, like, oh, it's Godzilla. Like, what? Did I miss something here? <laughs> why, did we, why did we go to, like, chapter 20? And maybe that's my fault. Because I didn't want any spoilers going into this movie. I didn't watch the trailer. I just saw all the positive feedback for it, and I said I gotta see it for myself. So, maybe, maybe it was my fault. But anyway, DEH, it was never going to be CM Punk. If you thought it was going to be CM Punk, that's on you, man. You set yourself up for that. It was never going to be CM Punk. Uh, Ali with the two bucks. If not Cole or Britt, then who? Well, there's Jack Perry. Why else have they held him, held him back from television? He still hasn't come back yet. He has history with MJF. MJF said that you... Basically, uh, you know, lacked a killer instinct to be to be me. I mean, they could always tell that story. I don't know that it would be any good because I don't know if he can handle that role as a lead heel in the company. But if not Cole or Britt, Jack Perry would be my guess. Benjamin Espinoza, what's good, Hefe? Keep up the awesome work. I will. Godzilla, the college years. That's right. Don't tell me that wouldn't be a good movie. Look, they have this Godzilla vs. Kong movie coming out. I have no interest in seeing it. I don't know why. I just don't. Uh, Magician Sapphire, why is Orange Cassidy not defending the international championship at World's End? Whatever your opinion is about the title, it should have a place on the card. Now it feels cold. Yeah, no shit. Why haven't they had Takeshita challenging for the title? Good question, right? At least that would have been something for him to fight for. That's why I'm pulling for him in the Battle Royal on Saturday. At least then maybe he could be in line for a TNT title match. I mean, why wouldn't he be? Why wouldn't Don Callis want one of his men in the Battle Royal to try to bring gold into the Callis family? Why wouldn't he want that? You've already got Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher in the other match. They're not going to win shit in that match. He should want to cash in the Battle Royal. Hey, Dylan, thank you for the $1.99.
Uh, the Juliet. Gunther and Ginny are now parents. Oh, did they break that news today? I did not see that. Congrats to the happy couple. Now he gets to teach his son that the mat is sacred. Moroa, curious to know the answer to your question to MJF about the hate that they get from the likes of Cornette and Bischoff. I mean, Cornette and Bischoff, I'm not going to answer for Cornette and Bischoff. They have, th there's no changing their minds. They have their, they have their audience. They know what their audience likes to hear. It's all part of the shtick. But as far as my thoughts on, uh, you know, MJF's answer about uh, it being different and that, that, you know, that being the reason for a lot of the hate, uh, I gave my response. Uh, so if you want my response to what MJF said, you got to check out the last episode of The Sound Up. It's on episode 840. It went up this past Sunday. I played the audio of the interview, and then right after the audio from the interview, I gave my response. Nick Grosso. Where did this Stokely Hathaway storyline come from, and does it lead to a possible Chris Statlander heel turn? Sounds to me like maybe it leads to a Willow Nightingale heel turn. Uh, as far as where it came from, I assume... I assume some combination of Ring of Honor and Rampage, because... I wasn't familiar with it either. The crib is sacred, says Matthew Miller. There you go. Crib is safe. Rizzo. Well, this was an odd... This was odd, he says. I turn on the stream and the first thing I hear about is Big Show's ass. I love you so. That means you missed the entire actual review. Now you gotta go back and re-watch the review from the very beginning. Otherwise, I'm gonna be very disappointed. I'm not saying Willow Nightingale should be a heel. I'm just saying, I wonder, I would think that maybe she would be the one going heel in this whole thing. I still feel like she should be the one to beat Athena, even though she already lost. I don't know who the hell else beats Athena for the Ring of Honor women's title. Who else is there? If not Willow, then who? Prince Vegeta, watch Uncle Dave give Tony Khan Booker of the Year again. It's not... I give up. <laughs> Do people still think that Dave is the one who gives those awards out? I thought we've already established it's the readership who gives that award out. I think people actually think that Dave is the one giving the awards out. I mean, you could say that his his audience, his readership is influenced by his own writing and opinions, but he is not the one who gives those awards out. I thought, I thought this was well established. Hey, Del Fuego, he's been a uh, channel member, Sound Up member for 25 months. Five wrestling events this year. Sorry, I have not been on in a while. Life has been rough the last few months. I love you all. Well, I hope life gets better for you in the new year. So happy new year to you, brother. Uh, Boots, hell freezes over again. Cornette is the devil. Well, that would certainly get people talking. Jim Cornette was the devil. Bcom, see clearly three questions. Number one, why is Athena still in Ring of Honor? Beats the hell out of me. Number two, where are the guns? Beats the hell out of me. Number three, where should AEW go if not TNT or TBS? Happy holidays, Solo and Chat family. They should go wherever Tony Khan can get the most money for his television programming because otherwise they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And that roster is going to have to undergo some changes because he will not be able to afford the roster as it currently stands if he does not get more money for his television shows. So wherever that is, he needs to go wherever he's going to get this. That's where he needs to go, whether it's streaming, whether it's television. He has to go where he's going to get the best deal. Red Emissary of Darkness. Buy or sell? Devil or Dark Order? <laughs> the Devil storyline is not over yet. Ask me after this weekend. 
I, I am I, I can't I can't say dark the dark order went through a phase when when Brody Lee was the leader and he beat Cody and he won the TNT title where that was something outside of that I, I have no idea Samoan fan, Godzilla minus one had well-written human characters. I thought it was great because even without Godzilla, I was hooked on the sad story. Well, they definitely had some good human characters in the movie. But it does not change my opinion of the movie. And again, I didn't think it was a bad movie. I just didn't like it the way that other people liked it. Sue me. Tar and feather me. I said what I said. Moroa, I think Orange Cassidy is not defending the title because they are teasing a best friend's breakup. They show tension between OC, Trent, and Rocky on Rampage. Well, you know what? We have Rampage on Friday, don't we? So it's possible that they could still add an international title match 24 hours before the pay-per-view. They could very well add that to the pre-show. Samoan fan, buy or sell 80s Brett against 2000 Kurt or WCW Brett against Perk? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. Either one of those matches would be great. Uh, Brett wasn't quite seasoned yet the way that he would be in the 90s. So I'm going to go WCW Brett and per game. I'd buy on that match. And Daniel Malcolm, Mustafa Ali on that Randy and AJ. Oh shit, you know what? That's right. I saw that picture. He posted a photo Ali did from the gym the other day, and he looked like a totally different person. I thought he took his head and stuck it on someone else's body. You know, if he would have looked like that when he was in WWE, I think Vince McMahon would have Vince McMahon would have done something with him. Holy shit. I don't know. I don't know what he did, but he fucking blew up. He didn't see that. Go on his Twitter. He posted the photo the other day. But Ali, you know, he's going on this uh, world tour. And uh, he's got more dates booked than anybody else so far. From all the people whose uh, non-competes expired this past week. I mean, this guy through March or April is just booked out everywhere i mean he's crisscrossing the country into canada he's everywhere he's in high demand i do wonder though you know if he's going to maintain that that size that he has now uh what effect that's going to have on his in-ring style because it's going to have an effect it's going to slow him down a little bit he's been yeah he's been taking his vitamins and saying his prayers i guess so I guess so. Well, the uh, goal tonight was 400 likes. We are at 451. Thank you for that. You hit that thumbs up so we can get ourselves into the algorithm so other people can stumble upon this video and can listen to me talk about Big Show's ass at WrestleMania 21. I'm sure that'll get them to subscribe. Let's be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. All right, this is the final Be The Booker for a Dynamite stream. Hopefully not the final Be The Booker for 2023. We got two more streams left to go this weekend. So we're not done yet. But here we go. Be The Booker. Again, there was no Raw on Monday, and there's no SmackDown on Friday. So we don't come back again until Saturday night. I gotta say, not having to sit here and watch Raw on Monday... Having the night off to myself, I enjoyed that. I'm not going to lie. All right, here we go. We begin with the former Undisputed Tag Team Champions. This right here is going to be one of your matches at WrestleMania 40. The Usos, Jimmy and Jay, Yeet. We got the Usos. WWE would tell you they are the greatest tag team in WWE history. Because they are the longest reigning tag team champions in history. 
I'm here to tell you that just because you are the longest reigning anything does not make you the best. Uso is going to be taking on Team Hell No, Kane and Daniel Bryan. Team Hell No and the Usos. What well, that probably was a match back then, right? They must have had at least one match. I would think that match happened at some point. All right, women's be the booker. Here we go. Kick things off here with Maki Ito flipping off her opponent. Is that Sheeta? I think that's her. That's her, her opponent there. Maki Ito. This might be the first time we've had Maki Ito here and be the booker. Maki Ito flipping the bird. She's learning all the curse words and all the curse gestures here in English. Maki Ito going to fuck up her opponent. <clears throat> it's going to be Maki Ito against Becky Lynch. Oh, man. Imagine Becky Lynch back in 2018 when she was cutting those promos. Cutting promos on uh, Maki Ito. I think Maki Ito against 2018 Becky Lynch on social media would have been entertaining. All right, all right, so far so good, two for two. We come to the main event. This is our World's End main event. Kick things off with, well, wouldn't you know, our World's End main event, Jim Cornette. That's probably the look he has on his face when he watches AEW every week. According to some of you people, this could be the devil on Saturday. Jim Cornette. Let's see. Let's see who it's going to be. Could be Kenny Omega. It could be one of the Jacksons. Jim Cornette. Could be stepping into the ring to go one on one with Hunter Hurst Elmsley. That's a terrible main event almost had it we were this close to a perfect night Cornette had to fuck it all up honestly there were only two options it, it would have had to have been Omega or Vince Russo then I would have given it the bell because both of them are in be the booker but it was not to be Close enough, though. Hey, Del Fuego, have a good night, man. Oh, man. Two out of three, not bad. Not bad at all. Well, no SmackDown on Friday night. It's another clip show, so there will be no stream. But I am going to be back with you. We're doing back-to-back -back on Saturday and Sunday. We're closing out this year with three straight streams. Saturday night. After World's End, come here. We're going to talk about the pay-per-view. Sunday, episode 841 of The Sound Off will not be the usual audio show. It will be a live stream for New Year's Eve on YouTube. We're going to combine the usual New Year's stream with an episode of The Sound Off. So whatever news there is to talk about, we'll cover the news. But I'm going to be doing predictions. It is the annual prediction show where I give my predictions for 2024. Come with your own predictions. Share your own predictions. Start thinking about what you think is going to happen in the wrestling world next year. And we'll hang out and we'll ring in the new year together on Sunday night. I don't know. Maybe the drinks will be flowing. You never know. But it's our annual Make It Till Midnight podcast, episode 841. And then Monday night, the first Raw of 2024. It's the day one edition of Raw. I'll be live after that as well. So you're going to get me back to back to back. Bring those likes. Maybe we'll get to do Be the Booker. Back to back to back. The trifecta, that's right. 
Uh, anyway, keep an eye out because tomorrow at some point later in the day, my Iron Claw review, once I get it recorded, uh, will be up for you guys. So if you want to know my thoughts on the movie, uh, the good and the bad, and uh, whether I think it's worth seeing, it'll all be in that uh, review. So keep your eye out for it. Uh, until then, be well. Stay safe. Thank you all for the love. Thank you for hanging out with me all year long on these Dynamite streams. For, uh, what is this, the fourth year in a row? When did Dynamite start? 2019, right? October. So it hasn't quite been a full... Well, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on into 2024. We'll have another great year of Dynamite recaps. You guys will come by. You know the drill. I got you covered every week. But for those of you who may be have plans you're not going to be around this weekend let me just take a moment here to wish you all a very happy new year thank you all for your support all throughout 2023 hopefully you'll be back with me in 2024 and for those of you who will be here i will see you then until then take care guys